Hi, good evening, um, and welcome to Simon Fraser University. I think I know many of you, but if I don't, my name is Amy Kazimerchik, and I'm the curator at the Audane Gallery, which is part of SFU Galleries. And we are very pleased to co-present Ricardo Bassbaum's Artist Talk and Exhibition, the production of the artist as a collective conversation with SFU School for the Contemporary Arts. Ricardo is visiting us from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, as the School for Contemporary Arts Audane Visual Artist in Residence for the month of October. Um, as part of his residency, Ricardo has been teaching an intensive seminar in the School for Contemporary Arts with Sabina Bitter, and we're honored to co-host the seminar which considers how the image of the artist in const is constructed and what the prevailing conditions on artistic production are in the gallery, as well as support students to produce work with Ricardo's new basis of personality object and compose a collective conversation, both of which will emerge in the exhibition over the next eight weeks. Um, I'd like to thank SFU Gallery's director, Melanie O'Brien, and gallery coordinator, Brady Cranfield, for their continued support of our endeavors, as well as the SCA faculty, Judy Radul, for coordinating the residency program, and Sabina Bitter for introducing Ricardo's practice to all of us and collaborating on the seminar and exhibitions development. Um, I'm going to introduce Curtis Grauhauer and Lucien Duray who are two graduate students participating in Ricardo's seminar to introduce him and his practice and the work that they're doing with him. Hello. Uh, I didn't really do my homework, so I'll sort of be paraphrasing out of the, uh, the written material that accompanies the, uh, the show. Uh, since the early 90s, Brazilian artist Ricardo Bassbaum has incited artistic encounters by inviting people to engage with and respond to systems of symbols and rules embedded in objects, scripts, diagrams, maps, and games. The title of the show, The Production of the Artist as a Collective Conversation, is an exhibition that will take place or that will form over the following eight weeks, uh, beginning tonight, uh, that frames the gallery as a critical site of pedagogical and artistic production. So over these eight weeks, the gallery will accumulate images as people uh, participate with the new bases for new bases of personality, rather object, which is currently, I think, in the glass vitrine. Um, so myself and Lucien uh, are part of the uh, class that Ricardo was teaching with Sabina, and we actually got to participate uh, with this object. I don't know if any of you were at the Andreas Bunte talk uh, a few weeks ago, but the object made an appearance uh, here as well uh, as part of the project. Uh, would you like to participate in an artistic experience? Uh, this project Ricardo has been doing since 1994. Uh, if the object, if you're not familiar with it, is a polygonal steel sculpture uh, that some people have described that looks like a, um, uh, a loo or a cake pan or other things. Um, and also, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ricardo, you also, this piece is also in other places around the world in Rio currently and Bilbao, yes? So this isn't the only site uh, where this object is existing right now. Uh, okay, and um, it, in addition to Curtis and I from the MFA program, uh, Ricardo's class, taught with Sabine Bitta and TA'd by Deborah Edmiades, includes 18 third and fourth year undergraduate students studying visual arts, music, or visual culture and performance studies. We meet Fridays and Saturdays from 10 to 5 for the month of October. Fridays are spent discussing assigned readings uh, organized around topics relating to Ricardo's practice and research interests, such as awareness of the presence of affective layers, the poetics of art life, and its strategies of contact with humans, non-humans, and things. Artwork production, production and event construction as a relational set, the performative as methodology. The artwork as carrier of a conceptual aggregate set in motion. The image of the artist to build oneself to be built in public. The artist's practice as a mode of pertaining to a generational collective or communitarian formation. The artwork as activator of historical articulations in a trans-temporal present. Saturdays in the gallery uh, are spent collectively writing the script for a collective conversation. The conversation will feature 23 performers, including all of the students in the class, as well as Ricardo, Sabina, and Deborah. The script is influenced by our assigned readings, 
the experience of listening to each other's voices and to each other's languages. It includes observations, our personal anecdotes, and our individual and collective rhythms. Please join us for our performance of the collective conversation on October 29th at 6 p.m. in the gallery. Thanks. So I think we'll hear from Ricardo now. Thank you for Lucien and Kurt, Curtis for this uh, brief introduction. I, I'd like to thank Amy, Kazimirchik, for all the conversations that um, made possible to be here. Also, Sabine Bitter for the invitation three or four years ago. Uh, Judy Radu, Melanie O'Brien, um, Brady Cranfield, Dylan McHugh, and Kevin Romaniak, also for helping to install the exhibition. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to address some words. Uh, just before the opening. So what I prepared is just like five topics that I thought might be interesting to introduce in terms of creating a kind of first approach to my practice. And then when we go to the exhibition, I think maybe things will get more concrete. So I read, excuse me for any eventual mistakes, I had no time to really make a proper a review of all the writing, but I think um, basically you can understand me, I hope. Um, so I start. In 1999, I decided to reduce all my work to one direct and simple drawing as a way to keep the research going ahead. The drawing was conceived of as a mnemonic device that could enter immediately your body, enter into your body, as a sort of artificial or implanted memory. The way of acting was through contact and contamination. So this drawing is also a virus that from the moment when you experience it, it starts to circulate in your body in a dialogue with what sociologist Thierry Bardini calls the hypervirus, which is a metaphor for processes of thinking, production, and distribution on the end of the 20th century. The strategy of development, of developing the work, is directly related to the decision of developing the work in an area where contemporary art and communication strategies overlap. The mater materiality of thought, the immateriality of the body, and the instantaneous messages. But also the body taken as an entity that can be reconstructed, fabricated through your own effort when contaminated by this particular art virus. Also, uh, the drawing this drawing, or that drawing, as, uh, is a sort of specific shape. It's a sign with its proper semiotic layers, and therefore is composed by visual and verbal matters. Then comes the decision of naming it after three letters, N, B, P, which stand for New Basis for Personality. Of course, there are some humor when I pronounce this. I always look at the faces to see eventual smiles. But at the same time, at the, same time the three letters also permit a kind of fast memorization. So, new basis for personality also points clearly to process of transformation, the production of some difference. This visual and verbal sign provided me with the possibility of developing at the same time the materiality of the proposition and its discursive layers, reacting against the image of the artist who is not concerned with that aspect of contemporary art practice, which in 1980s in Brazil 
um, where I started working. Um, the image of the artist was very much close to the idea of the artist as employee of the gallerist. Also, NBP provided me with the possibility of working, working in terms of a long-range project, as the visual and discursive layers could be built along the years according to the process of building its reception and establishing its methodologies. So the, those are some aspects that I, with time, kind of accumulate, have been accumulating through different um, projects or actions uh, that um, permit me to create this, let's say, enlarge or make these dis discursive layers more thick. And these are some of the projects that I've been developing. Diagrams, Me You Choreographies Games and Exercises, Would You Like to Participate in an Artistic Experience, Reprojecting, Sculptor Architectonic Structures, System Cinema, Collective Conversations, and so on. So in a way, um, my effort has been trying to keep this system open to keep a conceptual structure open uh, in terms of how this artist can be built and cultivate this a sort of special vocabulary. In Brazil, uh, the 1980s, when I started my work, configured uh, an important moment as the military dictatorship was in it, its last period. It lasted from 1964 to 1990. During the 80s, civil rights had been recovered, but still it was not possible to vote for president. My generation, though, was very welcome to the cultural circuit. We were all in our 20s, and society saw this new group of artists as the ones who were bringing the new political and behavioral agenda, more freedom, after the heavy and closed years of strong state control. At the same time, this was the period when new liberal economy started to move globally, beginning to produce the changes that we witness clear, clear, clearly today with the new communication and digital networks. So the 1980s in South America, as well as in, in Eastern Europe, were marked by this double shift, the end of the strong state control governments and the arrival of the new liberal market. Some people call integrated world capitalism, as Felix Guattari, or cognitive capitalism, or, or cultural capitalism, or digital capitalism, etc., etc. It was not a coincidence, therefore, that in Brazil and in the world, the visual artists started to be so visible, or sorry, the visual arts started to be so visible. That field started to play a role as part of the macroeconomy in close relation to corporative interests. When I started the NBP project, there was the possibility to unfold it in certain paracorporative terms, making of it a sort of enterprise. But it seemed more interesting to use it as a tool to organize um, a platform for developing projects on the micro level of art practice, in close contact with its reception and in dialogue with the work of certain artists and, th artists and thinkers. Later, the work, when the work was being developed, the in insistence in the drawing of the drawing, in returning again and again and again, made me realize that it had its aspects of trauma for never disappearing and returning every time. So thinking about that drawing, about making a next project with the drawing, and the drawing returning so strongly that I found that it was possible to do something else. Uh, uh, where, why is this drawing returning all the time? Um, that should be really marked there should be a kind of trace of that. And then I considered this aspect of, of trauma, as you can read in this uh, diagram. 
But then I realized that this trauma was related, in fact, not to a personal trauma, but it was related, in fact, to the process of, or the processes of how I built myself as an artist in the particular context of the 80s in Brazil. And it was clear that the process of being an artist, of making art, is not separated from the process of producing myself as an artist, of the production of the artist. So in a way, after working in the 80s and in the end of this decade, entering the 90s with that drawing, reducing all my work to that drawing, is also a kind of reaction to this first 10 years of, uh, let's say, building myself in that particular context and kind of learning, uh, more or less, how was it possible to react there. Here are some images of a kind of first series of this NBP project. As you see, the structures are all of them kind of body scale, so it is possible to see it, to cross doors, to jump obstacles, and to relate directly to the pieces. The work of Ligia Clark and Helio Chisica have always been referential to my practice. The transformative aspect of NBP comes direct from their effort of producing the transformations of the spectator through a direct form, sorry, through a direct relation to the body and the emphasis on the sensorial field. The methodology of contamination and contact, apart from belonging to a rhetoric of the late 80s via, via the writings of Jean Baudelaire, for instance, um, this methodology of contamination and contact points straightforward to Clark's and Oitisica's concerns with the body contact. And the development of a work that is loaded with affects and its effects. I consider Ligia Clark's concept of the organic line that we see here, this is a painting from 1954, when she writes that she discovered the organic line, but had to put it aside because she didn't, she didn't know what to do with this discovery. Uh, I consider Ligia Clark's concept of the organic line as a major tool for contemporary art, pointing to a conceptual art that is not exclusively linguistic, but involves aspects of affect and contact. Therefore, stating for a sensorial concept of art. This is where are the area, more or less, where is my work, where my work moves. The work of Clark and Oitisica depart from Rio de Janeiro's new concrete group, which succeeded in contributing to modern art genealogy in the late 1950s, producing historical difference and providing the possibility of expanding the practice throughout the experimental period of the 60s and 70s. Later, other artists like Sildo Meirelles, here, or and Valtesto Caldas, for instance, though very different methodologically from Clark and Oitisica, also contributed to establish a field of such sensorial, conceptual practice in Brazil. And curiously, very few artists there accept to be named as conceptual artists. There is a kind of general refusal of the label because there is a kind of awareness of not, in, not losing, let's say, a sort of phenomenological or sensorial approach. That's why I think that clearly uh, the work there is point to this sensorial conceptual aspect. Um, concerning the discursive layers that I have been cultivating in my practice as elements that indicate not only a concern with the aspects of, of the fabrication of the contemporary art object, 
but also with the possibility of building up a particular and specific vocabulary proper to the intended intervention. Being able to access discourse whenever negotiations need it. Um, it has been decisive for me to organize the discursive layers uh, in a sort of shift now, as not only written in printed words that go in several possible directions, I would say the artist writing, the essayistic writing, the possibility of voice in texts, etc. So it has been decisive to organize those layers as sound as well, organizing its presence as sonic environment that also permeates the contact zones with the art proposition. The tradition of art criticism, especially the one that departs from phenomenology, has always emphasized the importance of the confrontation of subject and object, viewer and artwork, as a moment when both entities act. And the perception, the perception then is an active gesture which is productive. And the aesthetic experience is also an action towards the world through the artwork. The possibility of writing from the contact with the artwork unfold, unfolds from this encounter, taken as a sensorial and bodily experience. Without such encounter, if only safe distance is kept from the art piece, we cannot say or write a word because there, was, there is no sensory involvement or experience. From this direction, it has been clear to me that the encounter of body and artwork can be taken as a clash between two different materialities, and that this is a sonic and percussive encounter. The sound of the clash of flesh and matter can be heard as the written lines of art criticism and theory and history, etc when voiced by the subject, the reader. That can be useful for recognizing that some of the mediation layers that permit the encounter of the viewer with the artwork are active hourly. And then we can hear the sounds that accumulate in the space here and there as the result of different levels of subject, body, matter, artwork, confrontation. We have room here for a percuss percussive politics if we consider that the body-matter percussion resonates in the space and that, and that different rhythmicalities encounter there. As a consequence of the recognition of certain audio and sonic tools and their use in my practice, their use in my practice, I could recently attribute to my writings produced so far the aspect of vocalization texts, suggesting that they should bring forward the voices of whoever reads them. So in a show that I have right now in Rio, one of the pieces in the wall, as you can see in the left, is just a list of texts, texts that particularly inform the works in that exhibition that were produced, let's say, together although in different times, and I could write this list of texts, not as bibliography, but as te texts for vocalization, expecting that the reader now can access those texts, not just as a kind of mute reading, but that reading also has to be permeated by the different voices. The pedagogy of the avant-garde. The importance of this reference relies in the aspect of having the art proposition as the site from where the mediations are produced, 
recognizing how it institutes processes as a result of the intensity of the contact with its sensorial conceptual layers. In fact, that implies in emphasizing the value of the experience of such encounter, but also charging such devices, the artworks, as tools for activities against the common sense and as well as vehicles for antagonist practices where perceptual and sensorial habits have to be deconstructed and the subject comes to the forefront as active actors for grouping and degrouping practices, let's say community forming practices, aware of the multi multiple compositions of the diverse public spheres. In a period where contemporary art is part of the strategic agenda of macroeconomic cooperative planning, it is important not to lose the reference of the artwork as a site for the uncontrollable, that is, a place for multiple, possi multiple, multiple, multiple possibilities, where responsibilities have to be shared and the spectator is not a passive particle that replicates mechanically the proposition. Bioconceptualism is a formula and a term that indicates a recognition of the conceptual layers that structure the contemporary artwork, especially its integration in a system or network where meaning is constantly negotiated between different agents and actors. A system which is not destituted of an institutional aspect, of course, but also, when the artwork is approached as problem, it, it can be clearly perceived that uh, one important issue of the contemporary conceptual art proposition is that it cannot, take, it cannot be taken for granted anymore what an artwork is. And is, this is the problem that has to be continuously fabricated and distributed. Then, the conceptualist practice, and I say conceptualism as different from conceptual art, that was appointed, stated by Luis Kaminitzer and others when they organized the conce global conceptual art, global conceptualism show, when they made a difference between conceptual art, which belongs more to the British and North American conceptual groups, uh, they make a difference between that and conceptualism that relates more to South America, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and global conceptualism. So, the conceptualist practice assumes as its task some of the, some of the aspects of such negotiations, especially taking place in the material context of its appearance. But to articulate it as bioconceptual means a proposition, uh, as a bioconceptual proposition, means to assume by one side the need to comprehend that for artworks it is necessary to consider its sensorial conceptual matrix to escape the risk of facing the reductive mind body split again. By another side, the presence of the biopolitical body, or biopolitical body, I don't know, uh, as central to the current policies of production and administration of contemporary art requires some other tools that permit uh, the fabricated intervention, the intervention proposed, uh, permit that this intervention avoids easily instrumentalization by the multiple interests of a highly complex economy of culture, where artworks many times seem to be just side effects of larger and well-planned corporate and institutional strategies. This map that you see in the background um, is a sort of art, art history map where I try to locate my practice in terms of the uh, context of the 80s in Rio de Janeiro and Brazil. And one of the corners, um, it is pointed more or less how this idea of bioconceptualism or bioconceptualism uh, relates to this NBP project. 
And also last year in one event that I took part at Columbia University about Elite Sika in New York, it was possible as well to kind of locate this idea in terms of the work of Elite Sika as well. Finally, the production of the artist as problem and conversation is what we have been discussing here, but not only here. But whenever we careful approach each moment of one encounter as a moment for negotiation, there is a line of encounter that makes each agent to move outside of itself. And in fact, it is decisive to realize that the position and the role of the artist is not an area of the subject's achievement of desires, simply that, but also an area where, let's say, society also projects its own interests and positions. In the production of the artwork and its reception layers, the artist is also produced, distributed and traded as one of its effects, as the result of a multiple operation. Our rotation should rely um, in not be simply captured, completely captured by what we could consider results of this process. But more interesting would be to take the opportunity for comprehending that this is a moment of activation where things can be moved and redistributed according to some other lines that are there for a brief instant, particularly intense. So here we see some of the, some of the collective conversations I've been doing in the last years. And of course, we expect soon to be able to organize um, the work here as this live performance, which will be later addressed in a situation like that in the exhibition. Now what we you can see there is just this structure without the sound, and the sound is going to be integrated just after we organize this reading and recording, and then the sound goes into the exhibition, let's say, as one of the elements to mediate the access there. This is it. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, those structures, they are solid enough to be used without any kind of preoccupation of, um, they resist to the movement of, of the visitor, let's say. But also they are not completely friendly, they are not a lounge, they don't make, a, let's say, completely comfortable lounge. They are in, in kind of, they are in public areas and of course public areas don't offer, let's say, uh, the protection or even the comfort of your own private, uh, anyone's private place, whatever. So this code and, and 
hard metal structure in a way uh, helps to um, when you come from from the streets let's say in a certain rhythm you enter the gallery and you are confronted with another let's say rhythmicality of that installation space as any in any other exhibition and let's say this metal works, metal pieces help in terms of uh, kind of pinching your skin, uh, in terms of contributing to bring you to that, let's say, here and now of that particular space uh, of a sort of experience. Um, and this is more or less um, kind of rhetoric or a kind of reference to the use I've been doing of those, let's say, architectonic structures that are body scale and invite the, the, use, the viewer to use them uh, in a certain way, to sleep or to rest or jump or cross doors, etc. Um, the thing about the sensorial conceptual uh, is a way of avoiding a kind of um, relation of text and um, let's say artworks that historically uh, conceptual art pointed um, directly to a certain kind of philosophy, let's say analytical philosophy, language philosophy, um, and try to let's say open the relation of text and artwork um, to the sensorial aspects of this of the experience that um, sometimes in terms of artists, art criticism and theory or how works have been framed, how works have been planned and conceived, uh, you know, those things sometimes they, because they have different emphasis in different times and different strategies and in, and in different, um, how can I say, methodologies. Uh, it seemed important to me to point that they are kind of complementary aspects. And also, if we read a certain, um, let's say, vocabulary or certain uh, thinkers, they point to the importance of uh, that concepts are already affected, uh, affective, loaded entities. So because tradition always points to the separation of mind and body. Uh, artworks are, is, are s devices that really um, integrate this in a certain balance. I mean, I don't know if you want to comment something. Mm. Contact and con contamination. Yeah. No. Oh, yes. I mean, when I structured this this drawing that I presented you in the beginning, no. Um, the main task was basically to play with memory. But of course, through the contact with the art piece, um, and then this is obviously also a sort of virus, no? That um, circulates in your body. Uh, so when this project started in 1990, it was uh, structured around this idea of contaminating the other. Also through anthropology, I was reading things about uh, epidemiology of cultures, um, this interesting sociologist, uh, Canadian sociologist Thierry Bardini, that uses the word hypervirus, um, he thinks that a good metaphor for the second half of 20th century is around the idea of the virus. So uh, also this idea that you, uh, through artworks and its effective layers, you don't need to, let's say, uh, because, of course, the verb and the word has much more authority in general in, let's say, in the standard uh, patterns of Western culture. And artworks kind of reverse this thing 
point to the importance of experience, um, affect comes really direct and affect contamination, micro-perception. Uh, the work of Ligia Clark, when he, she tries all the time to rebalance the economy of the senses, and because of she does this, she is able to rearrange the body and think really in terms of a sort of therapy uh, or a therapeutic process because she reorganizes the economy of the senses of the body. And because of that, she can access uh, this restructure operation. Um, ideas like the techniques of the self from Michel Foucault, all those things, they contribute to come close to those aspects of affective layers, um, kind of instantaneous transmission, the immediate, immediate contact. Um, so, I mean, that, that's how I've, how I've been organizing this, those layers of, of affect and contamination. Um, yes, I, I think, it, well, this word came really um, very natural, um, but in a way, in terms of the context in Brazil, uh, historically, the conceptual art term has been kind of rejected, basically because of the strong influence of new concretism and the experimentalism of Ligia Clark and Eliud Sika. So, uh, in a kind of direct reception, it seemed that conceptual art, uh, just like that, uh, would make us lose certain aspects that seem to be really important. Basically, let's say, this bodily experience or sensorial experience, whatever, which is also in the root of the split of the new concrete group with the concrete group in Brazil. This is an interesting story from the 50s, the concrete group of the poets, but also of some artists. And then the new concrete group came as a kind of dissidence from the concrete. And the dissidence was based basically in a sort of organic aspect or in a sort of recovering of subjectivity uh, in, the, in the late 50s. So, um, also, this aspect of the general macroeconomy or the politics has, as it has been recognized by many different thinkers, uh, this new global economy is based as well in the idea of the production of life, in the idea of uh, managing effective layers as well. And when everyone is productive, is producing its own system of government in a way, it creates a kind of, a kind of double uh, bind layer, no? Where the, the, which makes also each, uh, let's say, one equally responsible uh, with this process of production, him or, her, or herself. Then it's not a coincidence, of course, uh, how the work, the late work of Michel Foucault, of the techniques of the self became so cent central to this discussion. So thinking about uh, the work of, of Ligia Clark and Eliud Sika as a conceptual artwork, but a different kind of conceptual artwork that never accepted to be a way of the body, 
uh, and cultivated experience and cultivated the possibility of a sort of healing in a general sense uh, in terms of um, providing, let's say, experience as a way, as a political tool, as a micro-political tool. I think this idea of the bio-conceptual art points to even to a kind of institutional critique or institutional resistance or institutional practice uh, that um, can address some aspects of, of, of the biopolitical body in terms of, of the, the actual word, no? I mean, those are kind of general things. Uh, Uh -huh. And also I think this idea that, um, you know, artwork is a, is a sort of institutive, institutive tool. I mean, of course, you have institution at the same time, you have an artwork and a viewer, you have already an institution. So um, it is a sort of instituent practice uh, in itself. So, let's say the quality of those relations, if we want to care in terms of the, those, some of the bio aspect, bio uh, conceptual issues, uh, would point to that uh, process, I would say. Yeah, no, good question. I mean, this question comes sometimes, and I'm not able to answer it completely, but I, I can say, Something. I mean, I, I, I don't see them as, as prisons, I see them as, as uh, borders. So I see as fences. So a fence not necessarily points to a prison. Um, I like the, this material because of its transparency. So I can create a wall and I can look through the wall. Um, and at the same time, there is a sort of ambiguity that interests me because there are many, I mean, there is a big issue in, in Brazilian art about participation because of the importance of Ligia Clark and Elliot Sica and the work of art critics like Guy Brett, who pointed many times uh, uh, for him, Ligia Clark and Elliot Sica are sort of pioneers in terms of this participation of the spectator, the way they, they did, uh, the care they had for this encounter. Uh, because of many of those issues, uh, there are many participatory works. I mean, this aspect that was in the 60s and 70s, maybe a very clearly political position, now it became kind of central to the mainstream of, our, of contemporary art. Participation, even art and life issues that were really, if you think an artist like Alan Capro, who need to get out of art to go into life, that was a really strong political statement. Today, contemporary art and art and life are basically similar things and, and, and um, let's say uh, art and life is in the center of the mainstream of contemporary art. So uh, I've been keeping this metal structures, those metal structures in a way to avoid that the works look completely lounge-like, friendly, completely friendly, relaxed situations. In a way, this strange prison fence like cold metal uh, structure that pinches you in a way recovering you from your sleep or your anesthetizing, anesthetizing moment. Uh, I've been insisting on that, trying to see when that can be taken into another direction, but so far it has been uh, a useful tool. Also in terms of the production of the artworks, uh, those this material is a very basic material from, from metal uh, workshops, metal construction anywhere in the world for industrial society. So you find easily those materials and uh, let's say uh, workshops to work with them 
anywhere because they are very basic uh, things, and that uh, this is also an aspect that inter interests me. Thank you.